Um, I'd like to first quickly introduce the panelists. Uh, Lash Eric Herstam Lapalainen, writer, theorist, uh, founder and editor of Tsnook.se. Um, then uh, Tore from Visby, and Olaf Westphalen, American German artist living in Stockholm. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have uh, we don't have Irit Ragar for the moment. Um, she got stuck in London, and we very much hope that she can join us for for the discussion later. So I would like to I would like to give give the word to Lars Eric, and then we would proceed with the discussion later. Jesus. Thank you, and uh, nice to see so all of you here tonight. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Livia for inviting me from the Baltic Art Center and Panilla at Rixit Stenia. Uh, and then I also want to thank for having this uh, opportunity to be the first one to speak. I didn't expect to be that. Uh, there is uh, a quote by Marcel Duchamp that I have had in mind for uh, many, many years, um, mostly as, a, as some, some kind of joke, uh, which always comes in handy. Uh, he says, uh, publicity always takes something away. And it's about art. He says it, he, he, he said it in, in an interview when he was describing uh, the artistic situation in New York and during World War I, he said uh, it was quite a bit of activity, but it was limited to a relatively small group, and nothing was done very publicly. Publicity always takes something away. Uh, I think this uh, point of view on the public sphere of, of art is interesting today uh, for at least two reasons for me. First of all, today, of course, uh, the, the general daily life view of, of, uh, of the situation is, is, is the opposite. Uh, today we would rather, in the first uh, unreflected way, think that this public sphere of the art, the art world, is what actually makes something into art. The art world is, a, is, a, is the difference between an ordinary object and a, and, a, sorry, and a work of art. And this is, this is an, uh, of course, an, uh, an idea that people have tried to, to get from Marcel Duchamp himself, uh, saying that he got this tremendous idea that you could take a, a, any object, a ready-made, uh, a urine or and make it into, an art, into art just by exposing it in, in an institution. Uh, so that's, that's uh, basically the institutional art theory. This institution is what makes it into art. And here it says something that it doesn't really go against it, but anyway, he says that uh, this publicity always tank, takes something away. Uh, rather than adding something. And the second reason uh, is this. It's, I, I get stuck on this, uh, this loss that, it, that uh, it takes something away. It's quite mysterious what, what it is that gets lost. On the one hand, you can say that this is the ordinary avant-garde uh, stuff that want a small circle of, of uh, or, or a kind of art that, that the general public doesn't appreciate. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be a critique of, uh, of people not understanding art or being too bourgeois to, to appreciate it. Uh, and it's not so. It's not the wrong audience in the publicity or in the public. 
and it's not either a question of uh, that the work of art is at home, as Daniel Biren, for example, wrote in text, that it's only at home in a studio. And then when you put it in a gallery, for example, it's, uh, it's in, in, a, in a foreign country, so you can't really see how it would behave in its natural milieu. Here is just a question of, of going public that, that uh, deprives uh, art of something. Uh, so this quote is, uh, has generated all, all of that I had thought for, for this evening. And my first question to myself was, have, have I ever seen that kind of art that he's speaking about? Uh, is there an art outside of the institution at all? And then I came to think about something that happened this, this fall, no, not this fall, uh, this spring, when I saw the things that um, an artist, uh, Linnea Sjöberg, had done. This is one of her pieces. Uh, I knew her uh, a little bit, or her work anyway, before I saw this. Uh, I knew that she had, uh, I think she left art school maybe two years ago. And she had, I had seen an exhibition at the gallery that she had as a student. And then I also knew that she had spent a year as a businesswoman, as an art project, uh, really living and doing business, I think. But when I saw this, uh, I was quite shocked. I, didn't, I couldn't see where it was coming from, or what she was doing, or, or why, or how. Uh, and maybe, could I have a next picture, please? I mean, all, all of a sudden, uh, from having been a, an ordinary person, her, or her body looked like the wall of a public toilet, more or less. Is it, is it visible there? Is it something? In... Yeah, 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 okay, it's, on, it's only from here it looks. Strange. So that's her, her hand uh, with the text, as you can see, read your cock here, and then a big cock on the other hand, uh, arm. And it's like that pretty much all over her body. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I was amazed and fascinated and I thought we, because I have a, a, a web page also, or a magazine, art magazine online, so I thought we, we should really show this. This is great. Uh, and it was great because I had really nothing, nothing, nothing to say about it. I, I was stunned. Uh, so I contacted her and uh, asked about these pictures, which I had seen on Facebook only. It was not on her web page, on her personal web page for her artworks. And then it showed, when I asked her, that she, she didn't really know if it was art or not. Uh, she hadn't really considered it. Uh, anyway, she, she, and I don't think, I don't know if she, it's on her page now, but at the time it was not. And she wanted to participate in, in this uh, publication. And she wanted us to just put that it was Salon Flitkarton, which is the name of the place or her salon where she's tattoo, making all these tattoos. Um, but uh, we thought, no, no, we put Linnea Sjöberg, that's great. It's, we more or less forced it into her artistic career. It felt like, or so I feel now anyway. And there are certain aspects of it which, is, which are art. I think you could have another picture. That, that for example, is a clearly a conceptual tattoo uh, where she visited a plastic surgery in, in New York and made him draw the lines where he would cut 
in order to make her breast uh, get the same equal size, same size. Uh, so, uh, but the rest of it was not really uh, conceptual uh, at all. It was like jokes and uh, uh, everything on her body is, it looks like it's, it must have been fun in the moment. Uh, what, what will happen when you see it for the fifth time uh, in a few hours? It can't be fun anymore. And of course, uh, that's, she disregards that, that aspect completely. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's just, you don't understand who this person is. And, and today, maybe also, I think it was a mistake from to insist that it should have been Linnea Sjöberg, who was the author of uh, all this, and not the Salon Flytkartong as a collective subject, because it's an, a strange scene or a group of people that she has comes to her her studio to get those tattoos. Uh, not, not maybe one made some galleries, but also very many criminals and drug addicts and uh, strange. Just it's 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 a milieu that, that she she makes her own audience there. And then at the same time, uh, more or less, uh, and uh, without having talking to me. Uh, of course, Ooh, love it, uh, took her, invited her to to um, performance evening, where she made tattoos. And then after a while, and that was maybe the first time I saw it. Art references started to show up in her work, like like this one, uh, where she so starts to comment on her own activity. Uh, I make noise, not art, and things like that. The artist is present. Uh, and then maybe a month later, uh, she, she said, now it was definitely art. It was a project, she said. And now, maybe a month ago, she has already made a, a, a retrospective of this project, what has happened during this time. And, and it's, I guess it's time for a book or something like that. And she has passed through Moderna Museet and everything. And all, all of that in, in a few months. And uh, uh, it has really gone from being something outside of art, uh, outside of the public, uh, to being uh, completely integrated into the art scene. And it's not, at least for me, that has changed something. It's not as fascinating anymore because, because it's art. Uh, uh, it still is very controversial for, in tattoo circles, where she has had very harsh response and even people wanted to kill her for doing these ugly tattoos. Uh, no such reaction within the art world, though. So I think this, uh, I start here because I think this is at least one example of uh, that there still is, or it's possible to, to have some kind of art experience of art being made not in the public or in, before publicity has taken something away from it. Uh, and I also think that this story this experience of mine shows me that Duchamp is, is correct when it gets, uh, when it's really integrated into the art scene and, and uh, so to say becomes something for mass consumption, as he says, it loses something. And uh, it's quite possible that it's just a question of vanity for my part that I think it was more cool when no one knew about it. Uh, but tonight, anyway, I'm gonna keep it open that Deschamps actually was right, that it changes something. It's just not a question of my, uh, my snobbism. 
and, and I also think that it, uh, she started to, to make it a bit differently. It changed for herself the, when it became a project. Uh, no, Sherik, I, I would, before we go on, I, I think I would love to ask Olaf if, uh, if he would like to respond or comment. Uh, oh, I, uh, I could say this. Um, Linnea is a student of mine, uh, so I kind of taught her a lot of things. Uh, it was very influential in many ways, and I'm quite disappointed in many ways also. Um, I think the, the one thing that I just off without preparation that I could say as a response to, to what Lars Erik just developed is that of course um, this idea that somehow art, real art, that's worthwhile happens where nobody is looking is, um, uh, has many, many, many problems. Starting with the fact that uh, then you're in a business of um, connoisseurship, you know, I'm the first one to know. Uh, and everybody else is behind, and by the time it shows up in art forum, it's already too late, we've moved on, uh, which, which feeds the market, of course, that kind of dynamic. Uh, another um, aspect is also that there is this uh, escapist aspect to it, that it can't happen here, it can't happen in the museum, it can't happen in the market, but somewhere there's the place where it happens, um, so, so there's a very romantic and nostalgic uh, notion that could be, we could say it's, it's a way to romanticize um, lack of success, lack of power, lack of um, uh, actual real world interaction. So I think there's a, there's a nostalgic and romantic possibility in this that I would like uh, Lush Eric to pick, pick up on or to answer to. Um, the other thing is actually, because, as we're speaking of uh, Linnea and her being my student, I wanted to show you something that I actually did when I was here at Buck earlier in the year with a group of artists, young artists. Um,
towards me, towards me. Um, and in contrast to that, I can show you Linnea's performance at our event in Stockholm not so long ago. Welcome. Welcome. Hello, Stockholm. Now, as you can see, there's a very different um, taste of music present. Uh, there's a, um, I think one thing that's quite important for me is that the work we did here in the, at, at uh, Rieks at Sterninga was uh, using found materials. There were um, tiki umbrellas that were used, they were left over from a show that was engaged in a kind of post-colonial discourse, which of course has a lot to do with the history of the house that mounts traveling exhibition that uh, has a kind of critical educational uh, uh, mission. And so, so all we did is basically use these things that were there and then in a very playful and, and truly collegial way um, created this performance that had, um, you know, texture, rhythm, music, variation, and humor. And I think these all are things that I uh, hope I can impart on my students. So when you see the other performance, there's of course a big difference. Um, uh, and maybe I want to show you one more thing from this performance uh, that we did in Stockholm. Oh, the sound is really low. Email on the other side. Can we pump that up? <laughs> what I'm doing? Then we will bring it out. With pheromones on five hundred dollars in do in twenty dollar bills. Uh, I think I don't think she can tattoo very well. I mean, honestly, <laughs> my mother can tattoo better than her. My mother is 78 years old and she gave me this tattoo here, which I think is a lot nicer than a lot of the things Linnea has done. See? She wrote mommy. <laughs> you see that? Great. Great and she had never tattooed before and I think it came out pretty nice <laughs> compared to what we saw there on the video. So, so that, that would be my, my quick comment, but maybe Eric, Eric there's a lot oh, to... Thank, thanks for... Thanks for this. Um, Lars Herrick, I, I guess you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, uh, I know this, this is not supposed to be a, a, a discussion about Linnea Sjöberg. Uh, you started it. As an example of, of, uh, of the ruinous effects of institutions, uh, an institution, by institution in, in this case, I, I mean uh, all the art uh, the public art uh, world, in a large sense, market uh, or or a public uh, institution, it, they are on the same side. There, uh, no 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 difference in in this context. And then, for, I just have to answer to that. I think Linnea, I think still still think she's really a great artist, and that's the only art I've seen for a, a long time that really made something to me. And then it was romanticism. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, sure, it, it, there is romanticism in it in, as 
as much as there is a connection between art and life here, which is very vital, and as opposed to artificial, maybe. Uh, it's uh, it, not an art world life, but, but an, another kind of connection between uh, life and, and art, which is very interesting. Uh, another aspect of my understanding of, of her work or of this situation that Duchamp described uh, is not the least romantic, I think. Uh, I think the main idea that the romantics had concerning art was that art is uh, an, I an idea. And this idea is, uh, gives a structure to the very work of art. It, it's incorporated and it's present in a work of art. Uh, and I don't think that's, that's really the case if you want to speak about this art before it gets public and, and then art when once it is public. Uh, I think this before it's some kind of almost art. It's experimental, Duchamp say. Uh, it's almost art. It may be not art. That's part of, of the charm of it. That's why it uh, shooks you up a bit. But this fact or this interpretation that it's almost art, uh, and this almost could... Uh, I think you, you wrote some time about uh, the almost institution as a, 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 an institution that functions as a, a surface projection, projection surface for uh, n not yet realized ideas in the future. And, uh, I think this almost art, which is not yet public, uh, may very well uh, function, give this dimension of, of a future to art. Uh, so almost art doesn't mean that it's less uh, art, it's, uh, maybe it means it's more than art. It's almost, almost only art, but a bit more than that. Uh, while the public art or art in, in the art world is just art or only art, it's not more than art. Uh, so there, I, I think, it, the relation of the idea of art is different in this case. The idea of art to, to the artworks is different than uh, it was during uh, or in the Romantic tradition. And this Romanticism is, uh, is on the contrary, one of the most common interpretations still today. That when you think that art is, is something that, which is present and conserved, within an artwork. Uh, that's the point of view of Boris Groys or uh, Agamben or, or almost anyone who is not into the institutional uh, definition of it. And then you can, uh, if we ask again, how, in, what's, in what way could something be present within something else? Uh, a, a general concept like art within an artwork, uh, then you only have more or less two uh, solutions. There is one platonic solution where you say that it participates, uh, this artwork participates in, in the idea of art. Uh, so in, in some sense it, it grabs, I, I don't really know how, uh, a piece of the idea. But then you don't get all the idea, the whole idea, which is very unfortunate for Platonists. And another interpretation came 2,000 years later by Spinoza, who said that this, this more general concept or this uh, art or, or being or something like that uh, expresses itself in uh, a particular thing or in a work of art. Um, but I think that in this almost art, then you have another kind, you have a separation between the idea of art and the artwork. 
which is much more like uh, the theory of emanation that Plotinus had, for example, uh, which says that this, this piece of art, it comes from, from art, but art doesn't follow with it. Uh, the usual uh, image for this is, is uh, uh, that art is the source, and then from this source, artworks flows. It comes artworks from it, but the source doesn't go with the flow. It stays on its place. It's still there. It's the source. It doesn't disappear with, with what it gives uh, birth to. And, uh, and in relation to that, I think the public, I, I don't know if you follow me here. It's, the almost art, almost art, and here you have the public sphere. Uh, this is like art as institution, art world. So here, as long as you stay here, like Linnea Sjöberg, uh, before it really became art. Uh, there it clearly had a relation to, to art, what she was doing since she was an artist. Uh, and, uh, but it, the people she made it with were, were not into art at all. But still, it was enough a contact that you can suspect that it had a vital relation, what she was doing, to, to, to art. But once you get here, uh, it, it, all the traditional relations are reversed in a sense. Well, what you say here is that uh, art is not what is inside or, or, or carried by the artworks. You say that the artworks are within or inside of art. Uh, so it's the, the completely uh, reversed uh, relation between the terms, the idea or the concept of the essence of art and, and an artwork. This, this public sphere, this art world, is actually the, uh, sees itself as the essence of art. This is what art must have, uh, or an object must have in order to be art. So this is just like a, here's, the source, the thing flow, flowing, the river, and it goes here into a reservoir or a pool or uh, something like that pool, uh, which is the art world. And there it just swims, it's swimming in, 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 in art. Everything you put there is art, regardless of uh, all, all those ideas. Uh, and I think what the, the, the problem, what, here you, you see what, what art is losing when it becomes public is exactly this the vital relation to, to, to its own idea. Uh, and instead, it's substituted by, by something going on here. Uh, which should be the object of, of a sociology or something like that, that people are just deciding about things uh, by different reasons, uh, that it is art. Uh, and cover up for, for this loss. I think you have a very similar or analogous uh, understanding in, in Nietzsche's philosophy between, as Duchamp had, uh, he says that, I think this is the way art misinterprets misinter itself. Uh, it, it, it only sees this, is mirroring itself in here. 
uh, without taking consideration of what is happening over here. This is actually a way of saying that there is no art or anything art relevant outside of, of our, our institutional stru structure. And in a similar way, uh, Nietzsche said that thinking has two moments or philosophy on, on one side you have to create an idea uh, on the other side you have a kind of a system that you put that idea in but uh, to give um, those two parts are different ways of thinking it's different works this idea uh, you don't get an idea by by concentrating or, or reflecting on something. Uh, these kind of ideas, uh, like illuminations, they just come without you having asked for them. Uh, and you don't really know where they came from. Inspiration, divine inspiration, or, or something like that. Um, and Nietzsche didn't believe in the inspiration thing. He thought it was depended on... on on, on, on contingent happenings or things in, in your body or in your life that may declench an idea all of a sudden. And he, 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 he asked, uh, during which conditions did I get this idea? Can I recreate these conditions? Will I get another idea if I take... Uh, is, is it better to... This idea that I got walking was much better than all ideas I, I got uh, sitting down, for example. When you start to walk in order to, uh, to create ideas, or you start to change your life in order to get those creative moments. Um, these kind of changes of, of your or relation between thinking and life, you don't have on this side, which is a system, is a, a question of... Um, having a certain goal, <clears throat> having a certain sense of order, um, and a lot of other things which are very good to have, and interesting work in itself. Uh, but once you start to put this idea into the, the system, you, he thought that you, you must be realize that uh, the aims of the system that you have, or that you adhere to, are not the, the same as the one who, who this idea had when it came to you. He seems to believe that the ideas are, most of them, very powerful things that would like to, to be uh, an end in itself. It would like to arrange the whole world in, in, for its own best. And here you have a great many ideas that all of them wanted to do that once. They wanted to be the highest concept. Uh, but now they, they have to work together in, in some sense. Um, anyway, if you only are preoccupied by this part and never get any ideas from uh, uh, through another uh, kind of work, uh, then you just have very minor administrative ideas. You can have, there could be a critique of the system, uh, of things which doesn't work there, or, or small things, but it will not change your point of view, or your world, or your life in, in any sense. It's just, uh, it will just all the criticism will more or less confirm the system being a part of it and being a part of it excluding the other uh, side of, of philosophy. And this, this kind of philosophical work going on there, uh, not even Kant, Immanuel Kant thought that was real philosophy. That was kind of school philosophy. 
And that's, that's what's happening to art, I think, when it also when it cuts off all the, uh, the pre-art world ideas, uh, it, it becomes some kind of school art, which does not uh, propose any, uh, any new ends to strive for, uh, or doesn't propose a new perspective on, on anything. Uh, and that's uh, this, the new perspective, uh, the new end, uh, the new desires, who wants this end, all those are things that, which I, makes this, this side, but it, it is a bit more than art. The almost art is a bit more than art. And this is only art. The only art has just keeps on with uh, its business as usual. The more than art has both the works and, but uh, is aiming for new contexts or uh, new ways of arranging things, uh, new ends, new reasons to, to do something. Uh, so that's what I would, uh, that's how, how, how I think this publicity always takes something away. It takes those goals, those ends, those other things in life away, which are not already recognized by the art system. And, and that's the kind of thing you would find here. So when you start to, to, to create art, when the artists start to, to move around here, uh, she or he will no longer point to, to anything that you don't know. It, you, they will start to point at themselves, just like Linnea Sjöberg did, by, by saying, the artist is president, or tattooing it, or I make noise, not art, uh, and stuff like that. It's just the confirming traditional art gesture of pointing at yourself in a performative way, saying, uh, uh, I, I'm speaking about art and it's art when I do it, something like that. Uh, it's just closing everything or all the art away from, from anything that would make art valuable or interesting. Uh, and that's uh, the big risk on the productive side, I think, when you consider art from within the system or within the institution. Should I answer to that? Uh, to, yeah. I, I, could, I could answer to that. Um, well, let me see. I might have something. Um, second. I, of course, think that the institutional art world is incredibly sad and incredibly a complete dead end and that any attempt to evade, the, and this includes, by the way, the educational system, this includes art academies, this includes large parts of art writing, this includes almost the entire, let's say, recognized system. Um, and any attempt to try and find these other spaces that may be before art or maybe not quite art or something that just vaguely rhymes with art, all those attempts, I think, are very, very valuable. Um, but I do not want to be naive about these things. I do not want to do it just because it feels good or just because it feels like what things did 100 years ago. So, um, so let's think within the institution for a moment and think what can actually art institutions do. And one thing that I would say is that um, institutions have their own logic. What do, what do all institutions want? Institutions want to grow. 
Institutions want to function smoothly and evolve their structure to ever more efficient, smooth uh, patterns, and institutions want to connect to other institutions, which is another form of growing. So institutions are these kind of basically, um, what do you call it, e eroding tissue, they call it in, in medicine. They create their own things. They want that. Institutions also are very much uh, um, subject to path dependency. You know, this idea down here that something develops and there's a moment when a decision can be made. Do we go left or right? If we go left, as we go along, the distance between where we are and where we could have been becomes increasingly bigger. With, with every decision along this path, to go back to, let's say, this point that was perfectly, at this point, these two points are equally likely. You see that? At this point, this is already long further away. At this point, it's way further away. So this idea of path dependency, of course, applies to institutions incredibly brutally. So one way to fundamentally alter, let's say to, to disrupt path dependency, is crisis. Um, so I, would, I think what, what I would propose is that within the, if we're talking about institutions, art institutions, most of us think institutions are means to an end. Here, I'll, I'll change color. We have an institution, and it's supposed to enable art. It's the means to an end. I think um, very often we find actually a situation where it's been reversed, where the artwork justifies the survival of the institution, which is, of course, sad and depressing uh, and problematic. Now, I think we should just get rid of this. When it comes to institutions, just get rid of this and have an institution that justifies an institution and stay fully within the institutional logic. Uh, if you want to change that, I recommend crisis, uh, full-on crisis, so you can start fresh. But the, in between there, I don't see, I don't see many options. Um, let me see, I have another little picture here. Talking about institutions. Um, here you see what, what, what a, a range of things that art institutions do, right? They, they uh, do production, art production, they do exhibitions, they public, pu publicize things, they produce discourse, they educate, they may have residencies. Um, they also uh, do social events, they establish partnerships with other institutions, bodies, da 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 da. They uh, get involved in politics and media, sometimes uh, uh, being discourse leaders and so on. They do community work, they do grant writing and fundraising. Uh, and if you see, there are certain things that point out from the, uh, from the art institution. That means this is energy going away, leaving. You know, you make art, it's gone. You make exhibitions. These others go at least in two directions. Social events bring back a lot in terms of networking, in terms of power, in terms of connections. Partnerships bring back a lot. Politics, media, obviously, community work, grant writing, fundraising. So what I would really propose is that um, one just gets rid of all this. <laughs> just forget about it. You're, I mean, the, the, those moments that Lars Eric, I think, very eloquently described, and I was trying to be an asshole there for a while, but I think those moments and conditions, they will not happen here. Just, just get rid of it, and and then uh, go for go for an institution that fully embraces its institutionality. It's it's about this. It's about structures. It's about making the structures better, more efficient, better funded, more powerful, and nothing else. Just forget about the rest, because the rest will happen like Linnea in her basement with her friends. The rest happens actually better when art is illegal than when it's legal, and all these things. So so so, and then I think you have certain options if you embrace this suggestion. There's certain ways of going ahead. Um, one would be, um, which I've already kind of said, is the, is the turbo institution. Just the institution that gets better, more efficient, uh, and more, more smooth than other institutions. You could also become a meta institution, which we would be, you get so good at all of these things that you become something like uh, the, 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 the brain trust and uh, consultancy and, and, and strategist for all the other institutions. So you move it one up, and all you do is you make, you, make you, be you become powerful by making other institutions better. Very cynical. The whole thing is very cynical. Um, 
uh, then, and then there's a, a last one, and that is if you're really not interested in these options, then I would say crisis is your option out to really provoke a complete um, disaster, and that could be a lot of fun. So I think, I mean, I call it crash and burn, and then I would say assess your assets, look at what you have, and just think of the best way, just blow it fast and spectacularly. You know, um, I mean, identify and, uh, assess your assets and identify your desires. What would you actually really, really love to do? I mean, get a sports car and drive it into a bridge and then have it built to the art center. Uh, space flight, write a program where all, you, you, all your staff has to go to space. By the, by the time you're done, the place is broke, but you've been to space, come on, right? <laughs> That's something. Burn down a house, but get a lawyer first. I mean, I mean, these basically think of ways that are completely trivial, completely incredibly enjoyable that will provoke a discussion about the reason that there once was an arts institution. Um, and then you have a real discussion. And then you also can do things in secret again because you won't have an institution anymore. I think those, are, those would be kind of um, very nice... Um, those would be my suggestions to evade the, let's say, the sadness of being caught inside the institution and wishing for that with it, which escapes that, and which by definition always must escape that. Do you have some, do you, what do you? Yeah, uh, this time I agree on everything. I just think the kind of, the art kind of disappeared, uh, and maybe al also the art uh, discourse, which I think is a nice thing. Uh, and then I, I don't want, at all want to be polemical, but I have to say that naivety, naivety uh, that you criticized is one of the great values in life uh, that you shouldn't lose, uh, but try to win back all over and over again. If you're not naive, you. Uh, you're in the institution, too far in. Uh, shit. Uh, where were I? Uh, yeah, Duchamp's quote. Uh, it's also made me think about the 90s. Once uh, Duchamp, this public and not public spheres, uh, in the 90s, uh, was quite a heavy academization and institutionalization going on um, in philosophy. I mean, the 1790s. In the 1790s, uh, philosophy was became an academic discipline, which pretty much was the end of it. Uh, and what happened to it, uh, within, within maybe 10 years, it changed. Before you had philosophers, and then 10 years later, you had philosophy professors only. And the major problem for philosophy had become history. History of philosophy and philosophy of history, because that was what philosophy professors are teaching. Uh, so, so a discipline can disappear very, very fast through uh, an institution. So it in 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 uh, yeah, like ten years before Hegel's phenomenology of uh, of the spirit, which is a profound. That's the philosophy of history, so to speak. That still holding philosophy in its grip. Uh, the kind of debates they had in German philosophy and the forms of philosophy were quite different. A lot of philosophy was still made in, in, in letters. People were writing each other letters where they explained their philosophy. Uh, Leibniz sent a lot, a lot. The monado monadology of, of, of Leibniz, for example, it was a letter. Uh, the big debate uh, in Germany in the 1790s uh, was ca called uh, the pantheism controversy. 
uh, tremendously important questions were asked and discussed. But at the core of it, the reason for this discussion was that a friend of two philosophers uh, had said just before dying that he adhered to Spinoza's philosophy. Uh, so it was a battle over a friend and the legacy of a friend. It was a very intimate question. Uh, important things were at stake, but they were all personal. And then as an effect, all these philosophical questions came up. But it came from, from somewhere, uh, from a, a part of life which was not within an institution. Mm. So, history is, is what, what shows up first, I guess. Uh, not because uh, any kind of law, but that happened in philosophy, that has happened in, in the arts also. I mean, uh, a few years ago, a Polish couple, a collaboration from the early 70s, made some kind of world tour uh, of all the places you should be. Kvie Kulik, it was a documenta, it was, you, you mention it, you, you name it, everywhere. Everyone wanted to show their work from the early 70s. And the only, sorry, the only explanations ever given, the only motivation for showing this work, a great work, which you could motivate in, in many ways. The only motivation ever, ever given for showing it was that it was important in, in Polish conceptual art in the 70s, a historical motivation. That's the only kind of motivation that counts today. That's the only motivation you need for art. It should give you, art is there to give you material for history. That's a clear sign of institutionalization. Or when Moderna Museet and a lot of other big museums uh, collaborated to make a big Rauschenberg uh, exhibition a few years ago, which work did uh, they select? Which topic, which theme? Did they take the most interesting works today, the most inspiring works for artists, for example, the most relevant for our social situation, uh, the least known? No, they took the works which had the greatest historical significance. That was their curatorial concept of it. Because if you're interested in art, you're even more interested in history. You're more, most of all, interested in history. Uh, that's the idea in the art world when the art world looks at art in the pool. This is now what is becoming art philosophy or art theory. Uh, a book that came this year by Peter Osborne which set out to explain contemporary art tells us uh, that art, how, the way you should understand art or what it actually is. And you find it, if you look at the historical uh, ontology of the artwork. So even uh, this question of ontology is a question of what this artwork is. And even that is uh, just some piece of history. So he, he even called it a, a retrospective ontology. The idea is that this Rauschenberg exhibition or any work of art is contemporary now if we can put it in the right historical context and by doing so showing what it really is as a piece of history. It's not a question of uh, art having a future at all. It only has a history. Um, and this is what happens when, uh, when you stay, when the art world tried, starts to project itself 
on on the works of art and on the uh, creation of works of art, it only becomes history. Uh, this is exactly the situation that it was for philosophy 200 years ago, a bit more. Nietzsche was not the first one to react to it. Uh, it. It was a big topic for a while. But Nietzsche had the most radical idea, I think, of, of all the philosophers, and he wrote, uh, when he still was a professor, and he published it, it was a professor who published it saying uh, the only solution is to criminalize philosophy. We should make it illegal to philosophize. Uh, he didn't mean that it should be illegal, certain opinions or anything like that. It was not one kind of philosophy that was particularly uh, wrong. No. The activity itself. And they would probably do much more interesting things. And uh, came to think about it now, a month ago, the police actually showed up in Linnea Sjöberg's studio, 15 of them, and declared that her activity was illegal. So I still think she is a fucking great artist. Okay.